Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Wendy Rogers. Thank you, good evening. Thanks everybody for coming. Hope you can hear me okay? Yes, okay, great. So the title of my talk is Robots to Support Successful Aging, Potential and Challenges. So I'm going to introduce you to some of the robots that we've done some work with and tell you about the potential of robots for supporting older adults to live more successful lives. So that's the overall goal of my research is support for successful aging. And this is a graph that you've probably seen in some way, shape, or form. But it represents the total population in millions around the world. And the blue line is children under the age of five. And what you notice is how that's basically flat over time. The green line is older adults, people over the age of 65. And the number that astounds me is that this is going to be 1.5 billion people. And so we really need to think about this population aging and the effects it's going to have on our health care, our social, and our economic systems. So I try to think about support for successful aging. Meet my parents. This is them on their 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, they're not with us anymore, but I always have their pictures in my presentation. So you'll see them later on throughout my presentation. So when we think about successful aging, what do we mean? Functioning effectively and independently, maintaining personal autonomy, Retaining but also enhancing abilities, maintaining health, managing chronic conditions, keeping up with wellness efforts, and remaining socially engaged and participating in one's community. So I like to think about it as maximizing an individual's quality of life. And the reason it's important to think about it that way is that everybody has different goals. And what's a high quality of life for one person is very different than what would be a high quality of life for someone else. And we want to think about how do we enable people to maximize their own quality of life. So the Human Factors in Aging Laboratory is um, what I direct. And the term human factors you may or may not have heard of it's the study of characteristics of people and their interactions with products, with environments, with equipment. And it's thinking about needs and capabilities when you're trying to design systems or devices or environments or training and instruction to use all of these kinds of new technologies. So the shorthand term when you see human factors is designing for human use. So remembering that any of these things that are being developed have to be used by someone and taking that into consideration. And so in particular, the human factors in aging laboratory, my focus is on understanding what are some things that change as people get older? What are maybe needs change, maybe preferences change, and thinking about that so that we're designing technology for but also with older adults. So the projects I'll be talking about today, we've had older adults participating in our design efforts, in our research efforts. That's critical. Because although I'm getting there, I'm not quite yet an older adult. So I shouldn't pretend to know what their experience is like. Ultimately, the goal is usable and useful products, effective training and instruction, and I think very importantly is getting things out there into the community. So thinking about deployment and introduction of new technologies. So in our lab, we work on a lot of different kinds of technologies. And we take a very broad view of successful aging when we think about, well, what do individuals have to do? There's one category of activities that's referred to as activities of daily living. And these are the fundamentals, bathing, eating, drinking, moving about your space. Those are basic activities of daily living. The second category is referred to as instrumental activities of daily living. And these are preparing meals, paying bills, managing the medications, or maintaining your home. So they're a little bit more advanced. They may require a little bit more cognitive um, components. And when I first started working in this field about 25 years or so ago, this is what everybody was focusing on, as if this is all that older adults want to do. And <laughs> I think there's more to it. And so um, we actually came up with the third category that we call enhanced activities of daily living. And this is really everything else. So social communication, new learning, hobbies, 
working, volunteering, and participating in the community. So when I try to think about technology supports, I try to think about this whole range of things that people wish to do. And really, people of any age, right? All of us want to be able to do these things. So that's the background, and now we're going to talk about robots. How do we design robots to support some of these activities, to support successful aging? Well, what does the robot need to do? It needs to be able to communicate with humans, maybe show emotions. It might need to perform tasks for the person. It has to be trustworthy, have an appearance that people like, perhaps provide social support. And so all of these things might be accomplished through different categories of robots. So one category is personal service robots. These are robots that do things for people. Another category is referred to as a social robot, which may interact more socially with the individual or provide social support of some kind. And then the third category are what are called telepresence robots that enable you to be somewhere else. So somebody might be attending my presentation via a telepresence robot. So I'm not going to talk about that third category today, but if you have questions about it, I can tell you more about it. I'm going to focus more on the first two categories of robots. And I'm going to be focusing primarily on the human-robot interaction. So we can define that as understanding, designing, and evaluating robot systems for use by or with humans. That's what we mean by human-robot interaction. I'm on the human side. So I focus on the person, and in this case, the older adult. But of course, I have to collaborate with people who are developing the robot. So on the robotic side, some of the things I'll be talking about today, my colleagues are Dr. Charlie Kemp, Dr. Takanori Shibata, and Phillips Research and Willow Garage, who have either given us robots or designed the robots that I'll be talking about. So we're here at the intersection. Where does the human side and the robot side come together? So if you have any questions on the technical side about the robots, I probably won't be able to answer them. That's why we have collaborators. But if you have any questions about the human side, those I can answer. So let's start with emotion. Can robots convey emotion to people? And importantly, do people recognize that the, the emotion that's being intended to be conveyed? And so I'm going to tell you about a study that was conducted. I want to highlight all of my students. All of my research is done with graduate students. So Janae Beer and Corey Smart, this research was part of their master's thesis project. So this is, robot was developed quite a few years ago. This is one of the first robots that we worked with, and it's called the iCat. And it was developed by Philips Research, and it was specifically geared towards social communication. And so they designed the robot so that the mouth can move, the eyebrows and the eyes can all move, sorry, um, as a way to convey emotion. And they were convinced that they had designed this robot to convey a whole array of emotions and that people would understand what was being intended. But nobody had ever really tested that. And so that's what Janae and Corey did in their research. So I want to show you, I gave that one away, but I'm going to show you what happy looks like. That one's pretty obvious anyway. I'm going to show it again. Everybody gets this one. So that one's pretty clear. But now I won't give the others away. Tell me what emotion that is. Very good. That one's pretty easy as well. Now, <laughs> did you hear one word? No, I heard about three different words. I'm going to play it again. I think I'm going to play it again. Now people are a little less certain. It is intended to be surprised. And I have one more. <laughs> Again, you hear some mixture of things. And that is exactly the point, right? If we had designed this robot to truly convey emotion, you should all be saying the same thing. So this last one is intended to be fear. And they had a lot of other different emotions. They had disgust. They had anger. And what we found is that for older adults, they didn't always come up with the emotion that the designer was intending, unless it was very extreme. So we were also able to vary the intensity of the emotion. If it was fairly subtle, 
people didn't get it. It had to be very extreme for people to see what the emotion was. And so just to take from that, some emotions were easy to see, some were more difficult, and there are a lot of robots being developed today that claim to be displaying emotions. And I think we need to make sure that people actually are getting the right emotion when you're conveying it. The next question I'm going to answer is, what do people want their personal robots to look like? And my favorite answer to pretty much any question is, it depends, right? And my students get very upset when I say that. Well, it depends. But the question is, what does it depend on? So we're only really contributing if we answer the, that question. What does it depend on? So this study was Akanksha Prakash's master's thesis as well. And she was looking at people's perceptions of different kinds of robot faces. What did they like? What didn't they like? Why? And do they have different preferences depending on what the robot is supposed to do for them? So she showed them a number of different robot faces. The robots didn't do anything. We're just looking at the faces here to get what people's preferences are. So how much would you like a robot that looked like this to assist you with various tasks, like playing a game or making, direct, uh, making decisions for you or doing chores. And then we also had them compare different types of faces. So what she did to try to control things is we have a picture of a person, we have a picture of a robot, and this is a morphing of the two. This is an actual person, but we told people when they were looking at it, imagine your robot looked like this. What would your attitudes towards that robot be? Okay, so here's the next audience participation part. So of these four robot faces, holler out a number, one, two, three, or four, that would be your preference. <laughs> Notice again the diversity of opinions. So in our study, the younger adults all mostly liked number three, and the older adults mostly liked number one. So you can guess how old you are based on what your answer was, right? <laughs> So we did the same thing with the human faces. So here they are again. What do you like? One, two, three, or four? There's a lot more consistency there for whatever reason. Both age groups tended to like number two more than the others. Some of the others look fairly serious. And it, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details about the study, but we also interviewed them. Why? You know, to get a sense of what they liked. And they thought number two looked very caring and would be somebody that they would want to interact with. Then we showed them the mixed column. What do you think? One, two, three, or four? And I hear some people saying none, right? Because that's also true. Some people didn't like any of them. For this one, the younger adults tended to like number one. Older adults tended to like number two. So we also asked them about different tasks. So does it matter what the robot is doing for you? And so we asked them, if the robot is doing chores, like cleaning your home, are you more likely to prefer column one, column two, or column three? What do you think? Lots of agreement there. Isn't that interesting? Right? For whatever reason, when we talk about doing chores, they liked it to look more robotic. What about a more social task, like chatting, playing a game, or helping you learn a new skill? One, two, or three? Again, isn't that interesting what the level of agreement is? And again, that's what we also found for both younger and older adults. And then we asked about a decision-making task like investing your money. One, two, or three? <laughs> None. <laughs> we did get that. So actually, in our study, they tended more towards the, the mixed or the human-like. And so for tasks that were more doing chores or cleaning, they tended to like the more robotic looking, but anything that required perhaps a bit more intelligence, they liked it if it looked more human-like. And that emerged from our discussions with them as well. So we know from this study that appearance is important. You might have guessed that already. But what I, what I didn't know, and maybe you didn't either, is that the preferences differed both by age, but also depending on what kind of task the robot was intended to do. So we need to think about how do we design robots that everybody's going to like, we might not be able to, unless we think about 
who the users are for that robot, and what the tasks are that the robot is going to do, or maybe think about personalization. Design your own robot, like you choose your car color, maybe you choose your, your robot skin, basically. It's an option. So another study we looked at, what kinds of tasks need support for older adults? And are older adults willing to have a robot help them? I mean, they might just immediately reject the idea, I don't want a robot in my house, right? So we conducted a couple of studies. The first one was more about attitudes and reactions, so domestic robots for older adults, attitudes, preferences, and potential. And then the second one was their acceptance of a robot after being exposed to it, after interacting with it. And one of the things I like about the, showing you the author list here is there are five human factors persons and five, I don't know if I'm totally correctly, but roughly five roboticists. So it's a truly interdisciplinary collaboration with two professors and a bunch of graduate students working on this project. So in this project, we use the PR2, the personal robot, which is a robot that was designed by Willow Garage. And they designed it to be what they called a mobile manipulation robot, specifically for research and development. Not for mass market, not for sale, for research and development. And so they had a competition. And at the time, I was still on the faculty at Georgia Tech. And my colleague Charlie Kemp and I competed, and we won one. So they gave 11 of them away worldwide. What was interesting is ours was the only project that was looking at human-robot interaction and older adults. And that caught their attention. So what's the first thing we did? We had to name our robot. So this is Gatsby, the Georgia Tech service bot with interactive intelligence. Good, huh? I love my acronyms. <laughs> So we, I'm going to show you a video of what Gatsby can do. There's no sound, so I'll just narrate a little bit as we go through. So, and it's sped up because Gatsby moves relatively slowly. But this is intended to show you how it can move about the space. The base of the robot is the same size of a wheelchair. So anywhere that a wheelchair can go, it can go. It has mobile manipulation. What that means is it has grippers, and it can pick up things and, in this example, move something around, getting through the doorway. It's about my height. The question was, how tall is it? It's about my height, about 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, this is showing some of its how it can manipulate its arms and the range of motion that it has. And a student in media made this video for us. So um, really, truly interdisciplinary project. And this, uh, again, is showing you what it can pick up. And the fact that it doesn't crush the can is actually important, right? That's a very challenging robotics problem. And that it releases when you go to take it. They had a competition, and they taught it taught Gatsby to get us a beer, right? And it would go to the fridge to select the right one and deliver it to you. Very important. Oh, I guess it was sound. So here's a use case. Maybe if somebody's at the door, you could send Gatsby to answer the door. So you can think about how this might be useful for somebody with mobility impairments, for example. And this is how it's learning to open the door. It's not fast. <laughs> And it was still learning. And so that's one of the things that's interesting about the robot is it, nobody's controlling this robot. It's learning. And this is my favorite thing. This is, again, a way to show you that it's really not fast. But so a student team taught the robot how to fold towels. And so this is a very complicated robotics task, right? It's a complicated thing about kids trying to learn. So what it is doing there is it's looking for the edge has to find the edge so that it can grab it. And to me, it looks a little puzzled. <laughs> All right, there we go. Not quite, not quite. There we go. All right, so untwisted. <laughs> I 
And that also shows you how it can get taller, so it can lift higher. All right, almost done, almost done. <laughs> Yay, I got one done. <laughs> So it's not fast, but it can do a lot of things. And I'm going to tell you about what we did with some older adults. We brought in 21 independent living older adults from the community, diverse in terms of education, ethnicity, and they, they lived independently. So either in senior housing or in their own home. And we gave them a whole bunch of pre-questionnaires about their attitudes towards acceptance. And then we showed them a video, much like, not exactly what I just showed you, but much like that. And part of the reason why we showed a video is we wanted them to imagine what might I want a robot to do in my home. And if you do an actual interaction, sometimes it doesn't work or it limits maybe their imagination. So it they saw the video and then we conducted group interviews and we had questionnaires at the end. So we asked them standard acceptance questions such as, I would find a robot useful in my daily life. Using a robot would make my daily life easier, scale of one to seven. These are standard technology acceptance types of questions. The older adults that we interviewed were generally open to the idea. So the mean on the range of one to seven was a five, a little over a five. But the important thing is, again, their preferences varied by task. So we asked them, for 48 different tasks, would you prefer a human or a robot? And we explicitly asked the question that way, to force them to choose one or the other, as opposed to saying, how much do you like a person to do this? How much do you like a robot? We really wanted them to think about them together. So we have, if I needed assistance with all of these tasks, bathing, being reminded of activities, brushing my teeth, and if I needed assistance, right? That's an important caveat. If I needed assistance, I would prefer help from only a human, I prefer a human, I have no preference, I prefer a robot, or only a robot. So that's the nature of the questions that they're answering. So I'm going to blow this up so you can see it better, but just want to show you the scale here is only a human to only a robot, and these are all 48 of the tasks that we asked about. So first are what I referred to as activities of daily living. So helping me shave, bathe, eat, dress, what do you see most of them? I want a human to help me. So either only a human at the one or prefer a human at the two. Well, then we asked them about instrumental activities of daily living. And these were the things you might remember that were more chores. So making the bed, cleaning the bathroom, grocery shopping. And three is the no preference. And I was really struck when I first saw these data by how many of them said, I don't care. Right? I don't care if a robot does it or a human does it, as long as it gets done. And for certain tasks, they actually were more likely to prefer a robot to do those tasks. So I was somewhat surprised by these data. And then the third category are what we call the enhanced activities of daily living. And these were things like entertaining guests, um, getting the weather for me, learning to use new technology. And again, you're seeing a lot of these tasks, they're saying they don't really have a preference. That's actually pretty striking, right? If you think about the future where we may need to have robotic support for older adults, they're actually quite open-minded about it. We also asked them, OK, Matt, you've looked at all these tasks. So imagine this robot can only do five of these tasks. What would you want it to do? And the top five tasks were cleaning the house, right? Um, locating, finding, getting, bringing me objects, lifting or moving heavy objects, daily chores, or lawn and garden maintenance. So that's what they would want their robot to do if it could only do a limited set of things. But it's important to recognize that this study is constrained by the particular robot they were looking at. Right? If the robot looked like something else, this list would probably be different. So in the next study, we actually had them interacting with the robot. So this is a facility we had on campus at Georgia Tech called the Aware Home, which allowed us to bring people in to expose them to different technologies, and in this case, it was to robots. So we had them, and I'll show you a video of this in a moment, but we exposed them to three different tasks. One where Gatsby was delivering medication. One where Gatsby learned to clear away clutter off the table. And then the third was where Gatsby learned 
light switches. And this one, we specifically programmed it to make mistakes, to see how people would react when the robot made mistakes, and also to show that if you walk around your house, I know in my house there are about five different types of light switches, and they're not always at the same height. And so the idea is that it would take the robot a little while to learn your house but then ultimately it would be able to control the environment for you. So in this study we brought 12 older adults to the aware home, generally healthy, and we, we had them watch the robot do things and then answer questions. So here is Gatsby in the home. And remember again, it's not being remote controlled, it's, it's autonomously navigating through the environment. And you can see, let me see my pointer here. You can see right here it has a range finder. And Gatsby is looking for the person in the room that is wearing a radio frequency identification tag. And he's holding a medication bottle. So he's going to find the right person in the room and deliver the medication. And this is one of our participants, Mrs. Bullett. And you'll see her say, should I take it? And then Gatsby releases the medication to her and goes back to its room, plugs itself in to recharge. So in this study, we found the older adults were very positive about the robot. They weren't the least bit frightened. And they had a lot of great ideas about what the robot could do for them. Um, the students, the engineering students, were concerned that Gatsby moved too slowly, and we asked the older adults that, and they said, oh, no, 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 this is good. <laughs> it, mo it moves just about right, because this is a big hulking thing moving towards you. They weren't frightened about it, and they had a lot of ideas about what they might want the robot to do. But one of the things we asked was about this medication delivery task. What if the robot just brought you the pill instead of the whole bottle? Would that be okay? No, and I heard some people say that. No, I want to check, right? I want to look at it and make sure that it's bringing me the right medication. And so that leads us to think about this question of trust. What is it that's going to make people trust a robot that is supposed to be taking care of them? So this is a study by another graduate student, her master's thesis, Rachel Stuck. And she was interested in what people think about in terms of trusting a robot that's going to take care of them. And so we interviewed 24 older adults who lived either in independent living or in assisted living, and they already received care. So they had experience receiving care from a human, and we wanted them to think about, well, what would it be like to receive care from a robot? So we're focusing in this study on dimensions of trust, right? So trust is important for any kind of relationship, and in particular, a care provider relationship. So we can think about trust as having these different dimensions. So it's willingness to be vulnerable. And it, it's based on expectations that you have about the actions that are important to you, right? So we thought about all these different dimensions of trust that we tried to focus on in this particular study. And trust, as I said, is dependent on a lot of different factors. We interviewed older adults about their attitudes both towards human care providers and robot care providers. So we did an interview where we asked them about specific tasks. So imagine you have a human taking care of you, and they're helping you bathe. Whole host of questions. What would be your concerns? What would you want the person to be capable of doing? What kinds of questions would you ask if you were hiring somebody to do that for you? We also asked about medication assistance. Transfer is a very challenging task for many people. Transfer from bed to chair, if they're in a wheelchair in particular, wheelchair to toilet. But that issue of transfer, even getting up out of chairs, so we asked about that. And then general household tasks. And we asked either about the human or a robot, and the order was counterbalanced. So half the people got robot first, and so on. So I'm going to focus first on what they said if it were a robot that were taking care of them. So we coded all of their comments 
into different categories that emerged. So what were the themes that emerged from the discussion? And professional skills, and I'll unpack that in a moment, but that was the biggest category of things that they were concerned about, followed by, um, actually second is communication, personal traits, and then other. So let's look first at professional skills. So they want to make sure that the robot has the ability, the knowledge, and is reliable enough to do these tasks before they're willing to trust it. So for example, I'd want it to be able to lift proper, pro properly, excuse me, and to place me in the proper position so that I wouldn't hurt myself. And precision would be important. I want to make sure it was done right so that I could trust the robot. Safety, obviously important, right? If he dropped me or even if he hurt me while he was doing it, I don't know if I would trust the robot. And this is an interesting point. I was working with a fellow who um, is in a wheelchair. He has cere cerebral palsy. And he was telling me that he's been dropped many times by his human care providers. And so this is a real issue that people have to think about. And it might be a place where a robot could do it better. Gentleness. They need to be gentle because I have a lot of pain. So they're really thinking about the range of things that they would be concerned with. And then the next most important category to them was communication. So task specific, I would want to be able to tell it a task to do and maybe have it tell me um, where it's been used in the past and be able to communicate with me basically about its experience. So this was the interview question, right, that you might want to ask the robot. I'd want it to answer questions and give me feedback um, related to how I was feeling. And of course, it would have to understand me and understand my directions before I would be able to trust it. The next category was personal traits. So it would have to have warm hands. Um, this metal thing, I can't even imagine it, it touching me. Um, I want it to have the same values that I have which is very interesting, right? This is a robot. I'd want it to be friendly. This woman says, I don't know how much personality they have, but it could be programmed into it. And I'd want him to get along with the dog. <laughs> so, these are important things that people are thinking about. And then the, the idea of benevolence was interesting. So I, for, this has been shown in human-human relationships. But for me to trust him, he has to really show me that he wants to help me to do his job, and then I will trust him. Again, we're talking about a robot. So here's the list of all of the things that people discussed in the context of having a robot to care for them. Um, the abilities that it has, the particular appearance is important, all these things, reliability, predictability, safety, and then, of course, communication. The ones I have highlighted in green are the same ones that came up when we asked about a human, right? So all of those were the same thing. Doesn't matter if it's a human or a robot, I care mostly about the same things. The things that are in black are slightly different. So for example, for a human, the appearance was important, but it was how they dressed and how clean they were. And for the robot, it was more just general appearance, but also what it was made out of. So obviously, there are some differences. But in general, that trust relationship, the things that were important to them, were the same as with humans. So the, again, you're seeing a theme here, right? And these are not the same older adults every time, right? These are different older adults. And they're very open to the idea of having a robot to care for them. But they have very specific ideas about what it's going to take them to be able to trust that robot. The last robot I want to introduce you to is Paro. And Paro is designed for emotional support. It's like a pet, but easier to take care of. And this is a study that with Sean McGlynn. And Sean Kempel was actually an undergraduate student. And this was part of his senior thesis. So Paro was designed by Dr. Takanori Shibata specifically to elicit happiness and relaxation. No other purpose, right? just to make people feel good. And so he modeled it after a baby harp seal. And it moves, and it makes similar sounds. It has tactile sensors, so its paws move, its head move. It can feel when you're petting it, and it reacts to you. Um, and it senses light, touch, and sound. 
So we were interested in the potential of PARO for perhaps reducing social isolation, maybe reducing stress, or even just providing companionship to individuals. And before we did this study, most of the work that had been done with PARO was primarily with dementia patients. And we were interested in whether the typical older adult would be interested in this at all. I mean, they might think, oh, this is silly. I don't want that. Or they might think, oh, this is pretty cool. Right? So just what was, what was their reaction to the robot? So we brought in 30 older adults, and we observed their interactions with PARO. So we first showed them PARO, gave them a brief demonstration, and then we interviewed them about what they thought, what their attitudes were. And then we left them in the room alone with PARO, and they were being videotaped so we could see how they interacted with PARO. So first, we'll talk about their attitude. So this is just a word cloud showing when we said, what do you like? Oh, it's cute. I like the fur. It's cuddly. It's animal-like. So a lot of physical characteristics. But they also ascribed personality characteristics. Oh, it looks friendly or comforting or amusing. So these were the things that come to their mind when they thought about just general attitudes towards this robot. They had fairly positive attitudes towards PARO. So most of them perceive PARO as being useful to themselves and beneficial to people in general. So this is, would PARO be useful to you? And that's the green. I think I have a quote. I think it would be very comforting. And if I felt angry or distressed, he'd be very good. A good pick-me-up was their terminology. But some people didn't like it. Right now, no. But maybe another year from now, I might lose some of my functions, my legs or something, and it would be useful. So I was a little puzzled by that, because PARO doesn't do anything. right? It's not going to help you, but, but this is what they thought. Maybe they thought it would be comforting to them. We also asked, would it be helpful to other people? Yes, I could see people who live alone or who aren't allowed to have pets. This might be something that would be useful to them. And then on the negative side, I suppose if they were desperate for interaction, Paro could fill that gap, but I don't have that feeling myself. So you're getting mixed views. So it's nothing everybody's going to like, but people were on the whole more positive than I had expected. We also asked them about what you thought Paro might be useful for. And most common was physical interaction and verbal interaction. So I would just hold him and pet him. That would be nice. Um, if you need to vent, you could vent to PARO, right? You can't tell somebody. You could just vent to PARO. Nobody's listening. Um, or having it close by, just a sense of presence, I would find it to be comforting. So a range of different kinds of reactions. So unfortunately, we're having problems with our audio. So you're not going to be able to hear. I have a few short videos, but I'll narrate for you. And maybe we'll get lucky and the audio will work. What do you think, Tom? So how would you use PARO if you had it? Um, I think I would do, use him just for that very reason. I think if I just wanted a little mood boost, I would turn him on and watch him wag his tail and do this number. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and, and do a little squeak. Yes, that's what we would do. But yes, so so this is during the interview portion, and we deliberately have, and that's Sean Kempel's voice that you're hearing, the undergraduate, and we have him sitting over here because we want to see how the people engage with Paro. I think it's quite compelling that she's not, she's looking at Sean somewhat, but she's looking at Paro as she's talking and more engaged with it. Here's a second person. So do you like anything about Paro? Oh, yeah, I think he's real cute. It's something you could really just play with, you know, for mm -hmm. an indefinite period of time, just making him react to you. Yeah. That. It's almost like having a real pet in the house. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I have one more. Let's see if this works. So this is now after we've left the room. And so in order to not be so forced, we left them with some paperwork. So he had to fill out some forms. And so he's filling out the forms, and then we just have some downtime. And this guy was funny because he was a Georgia Tech alum, and he was very serious the whole time. And he's filling out his paperwork, totally ignoring Paro. But then the video picks up as soon as he's done with his paperwork. He 
says, hi, buddy. A little bit. So you can't really hear, and that's why I'm sorry about the sound. So he starts singing lullaby <laughs> to Paro, and Paro does at that point react to him and make a noise back to him. And Paro can be set up so that it can make noise if you're not doing anything, and then there's Sean coming back in. So it was really quite compelling, because we, we didn't know what they're doing. We watched the video after, and it was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And they were, most people interacted with Paro like you're seeing. They liked it. They thought it could be relaxing or boost their mood, as they called it. And we did ask them, if we gave this to you for free, how many of you would take it home? And I think it was something like 85% said, sure, that'd be great. But what also is interesting is, OK, so there's a novelty effect. This is interesting. But does it actually help people? And so one of the things we were interested in is how people engage with Paro and whether that did, in fact, influence their mood. So what this graph is showing is each and every participant, there were 30 participants, and how many times they interacted with Paro, either talking to it, petting it, touching, smiling, gestures, or moving. Poor Sean Kempel's honors thesis, he coded all of the videos and counted all these times that people interacted. And one of the things that you see is there's a huge distribution, right? This person interacted with it tremendously, and there's a few people down here that really didn't interact with it at all. And so what we looked at was the relationship between actual engagement and their positive affect. And the people who engaged more frequently with PARO had higher positive affect at the end of the study. So again, it's just an example of some potential of how this might be beneficial. And there's a lot of other things we need to do in the future. And we're designing some research right now to look at some of the longer term benefits. Does it actually reduce stress over time? Does it provide companionship? And then also, what are the characteristics of these social or companion robots that are important? Right? What does it have to look like? How does it need to interact? How responsive does it have to be to actually be helpful? Um, what makes them effective? So those are some open questions. So hopefully you've seen one theme of this evening is that it's a fairly complicated space when you're talking about human-robot interaction. And there are a number of design challenges. My colleague, Tracy Mitzer, and I wrote uh, an article for the Encyclopedia of Computer Science and Technology to provi provide some guidance for the design of robots that older adults might use. And there are four different, different critical components. First are the human characteristics. So who is using the robot? How old are they? What are their capabilities? What are some of their attitudes or personality that might play a role? Their experience with technology in general or specifically with robots might be important. What is their personal situation? Are they under a lot of stress? What are their goals for the robot? So all of these things should be considered. But then we have to think about the robot, right? So what are the characteristics of the robot? We've learned that what it looks like is important, what emotions it's conveying, but also very important, as we saw in terms of trust, is what can it do, right? What are its capabilities? Um, how reliable is it, predictable over time? How does it interact with people? Third are the tasks. So what is the human and the robot, what are they trying to do? Is it a high critical task? Is it a healthcare task where if they make a mistake, there's a high consequence of error, for example? Does it have to happen very quickly? Gatsby wouldn't be good at it, right, if that were the case. So understanding the tasks, how accurate it needs to be, and then what are the requirements for the interaction? So do the human and the robot have to be in close proximity next to each other? These kinds of questions. And then the last is the context of the interaction. So the environment that it's occurring in. So I always like to joke about the aware home that you saw. I don't know if your house looks like that, but it was clutter free, right? So the robot had plenty of room to just move around. That's probably not going to be typical. So understanding more about the living environment, 
who else is in the home, the social environment, and then specific structure of the environment. And then the context of use as well, safety considerations, stress, and so on. So all of these things are things that we need to think about when we're thinking about human-robot interaction. I'd like to end by pointing to a report that came out, now it's been a couple of years, from the White House Conference on Aging. They host these conferences every decade. And they published their final report, and I was really struck by this quote. They said, technology has transformed what it means to age in America. Web-based technologies, robotics, mobile devices help older adults access the services they need, stay connected to family and friends, and remain independent. And I read that, and I said, no, it doesn't. Not yet, right? Maybe, maybe it can, and maybe it will, but it doesn't yet. And I felt like they were doing us a disservice by saying, oh yeah, it's done. We can already do all of those things. We can't. We're trying, but we can't. And it remains a challenge, and that's where we come in. We have to think about, we're designing these robots specifically to support the needs of older adults, make sure they're both useful and usable, efficacious in the long term. Do they really make a difference? Do they really help people? And how do we integrate them into the family, into the healthcare system, and into people's lives? So there are a lot of open questions left. So I wish they had set that out as aspirational, right? That's where we want to be, but we're not there yet. So the work that I've talked about today is funded by two centers. One is called, these are my acronyms, CREATE, the Center for Research and Education on Aging and Technology Enhancement. This is a team that's been funded since 1999 by the National Institute on Aging, and we focus on design of technology for older adults fairly broadly. The second center that I'm affiliated with is called TechSage, which is Technologies to Support Successful Aging with Disability. And here we're focusing on those individuals who've had a long-term disability, hearing, vision, or mobility, perhaps most of their lives, and they're now getting older. That's a segment of the population that really isn't focused on very much. And we've been funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research since 2013. Always looking for collaborators, so if you know people working in this space, we're happy to have your participation. And then the most important slide, is my students. As I told you, they do all of the work, so thanks to them and thanks to you for your attention.